Gail Goderer is a partner with the law firm, and I have to read this, Axon, Veltrop, and Harkreiter. I got it. that right? You Very good. Right. Now, we're at the TU Automotive Conference. Everyone's talking about ride-sharing, car-sharing, connectivity, autonomous cars. You want to talk about liability, and yeah. I got to believe that's really forefront in everybody's minds here. When we come out with these autonomous cars and things start to happen, who's going to be liable for it? It is a concern, and the, one of the challenges we're facing now is that regulation and law is lagging behind technology, which is always the case. You know, law by nature is more reactive than proactive. The law kind of waits for things to happen and then makes rules. And technology, especially now with autonomous vehicles, is moving so quickly, the law just can't keep up. So we have some federal regulations and promise of more federal regulation from NHTSA, but on the insurance front too, it's very challenging because in this country, insurance is a state-by-state -state issue, which imposes a lot of variations which make it hard to determine how to create, how to design your car. So recently we had NHTSA say that artificial intelligence in the Google car could be considered the driver, but then we had the California DMV come out and say that you have to have a licensed driver in the car and that you have to have a pedal and a wheel, a steering wheel in each of them. Those are kind of inconsistent, which makes it challenging to figure out what's going to be okay, what should you design, where can your car drive. So it's, a, it's one of the challenges we face right now. And I've got to imagine that the insurance companies are worried more about this than just about anyone else. I think the insurance companies are worried and also I think automakers are also legitimately concerned that if there's some sort of a collision, everyone's going to be pointing the finger at everybody and they're the deep pockets. So they're concerned. I think insurance companies are embracing the idea that things are changing. There might be a severe decline in personal auto insurance because as you get closer to a level four autonomous vehicle, you're arguably not driving anymore. You're essentially cargo, as people like to put it. You're just being conveyed by the vehicle. So if you're not supposed to be doing anything really your personal auto insurance shouldn't be there it's going to shift to person to product liability law so the if you're going to sue the vet the vehicle manufacturer what legal theory are you going to have did they provide sufficient warnings it is, is it a defective product was there something else going on so you're going to see a shift I think in the kind of insurance that's going to take on a greater role but it's a challenge for auto insurers insurance companies to figure out how to underwrite it how do you price it you know, who's, who becomes less of a risk, more of a risk. You know, if, if somebody takes over driving the autonomous vehicle when they didn't have to, is that negligent, is that reckless? There are all these questions that the law isn't even contemplating, or we're contemplating now, but the law really doesn't address. So we're gonna have to fit these new concepts into existing legal models. So walk me through that a little bit of how you think that's going to take place. Is it gonna be on a state-by-state -state basis? Is it going to go up through the, the circuit courts? Is the Supreme Court going to have to weigh in on this uh, at some point? How do you think it's going to happen and how long? Uh, how long? I think we're going we're gonna to wait and see. Probably it's going to be a while before it hits the courts because it's going to depend how many of these vehicles are on the road and actually getting into incidents. You know, there's an incident on Sunday where a Tesla vehicle jumped a curb and crashed into a building and the driver claimed that it was the fault of the vehicle and he was already talking about there should be a recall and obviously contemplating liability for Tesla and potential lawsuits, Tesla fortunately had data that could show that he it was not in autonomous mode. The car was in, in manual mode. The driver hit the wrong pedal. He hit the gas instead of the brake. But just think about that for liability. You know, he you, you're sure he was going to be planning a lawsuit against Tesla, but the data proved to be a defense that will likely thwart a lawsuit. So uh, that again, that's a case that won't wind up in court where you won't be determining liability, but potentially it could get into courts. That would be a state court matter. And then if we wind up getting federal regulation and then some sort of federal guidance, th that kind of a case could wind up being on a federal track that eventually down the road could be the Supreme Court. But I think we're a ways away. The, the greater concern is that we're going to wind up in state court and we're going to wind up having juries and judges have to understand very complicated technology to figure out what went on and what's going on in these cars to determine who's at fault. And that's a challenge for lawyers to be able to understand that and present it in a way that a jury and a judge can understand and come to the right result. 
So that's going to be our challenge going forward. Well, well, the good thing for the auto industry, at least, is data doesn't lie. Yes. People can say they were doing whatever, but, you know, if you go back uh, almost 20 years ago when black boxes, data crash mm -hmm. recorders, first came into cars, there was a big argument over who owned the data. Was it the person who bought the car? Was it the company that leased it to them? Was it the manufacturer who made it? That went through the courts in only a couple of years' time, and it was pretty easily resolved. Do you see that happening at all with autonomy? I think the, the issue of who owns the data is still being debated. Uh, you're correct that with black boxes, it went through the courts whether or not the information was admissible, and that was pretty clearly shown that that's, it's valuable data, it's objective, you can verify how you got it, you can prove the method, so that is accepted as evidence in court. I think you'll have the same kind of thing with data from autonomous vehicles. We'll just have to do, we'll have to go through that process again to ex explain why it's valid and how it's collected. I think the other issue will be though, what are we going to use it for? How are we seeing it in employment cases? You know, if it's a fleet and you see that a driver is outside where they should be, and you use it for a determination should they be terminated or disciplined? You know, it's coming up in those kind of cases, so we may see it litigated there. But I think we'll have we'll have acceptance of that kind of data. The question, and it's it's a good thing because people now we see it a lot with juries. The CSI effect. People like data. People like things that. That you can prove without witnesses that you can put up and explain a methodology. So to a certain extent people are more comfortable with technology so that or with that kind of evidence more than witnesses who can be you know mistaken. The challenge also is though you have to learn how to cross-examine that evidence. You have to try to show either if you want that evidence out either the chain of custody was improper or that there was some problem with the technology which again leads us to experts and explaining a lot of this stuff but lawyers are going to have to get good at that quickly because this it's coming. It's here now and it's coming. It, it is absolutely coming now but just based on what you're saying here to me it sounds like this could get tied up in the courts for a decade. You know, I don't think courts will really be the problem. I think if we just had more consistent regulation or more consistent laws now, I think right now it's risk is created by the fact that there's uncertainty and it's hard to put a product on the road when you don't know which way things are going to go or what law is going to apply and that just creates, it's harder to ensure, it's harder to know, but hopefully in the next few years or sooner, hopefully in the next few months even, depending what NHTSA does, we'll get more guidance then you can identify the risk, you can quantify it, you can insure against it, and uh, hopefully the law won't be something that's inhibiting innovation or inhibiting these cars getting on the road, because there are tremendous social values in terms of reducing accidents, reducing pollution. You know, just you see all the people here today at this conference, you see how interested people are. There are some big name companies who are really focused on this. So it's here, it's coming, it's only gonna get bigger. So we need the law to help us move it along, make it safe and make it, you know, determine who's responsible for what, you know, make it clear that you really can't expect these autonomous vehicle to drive you home if you're drunk, because if it, the alarm goes off and tells you you have to drive and you can't, you're going to be responsible for that accident. So I think the law can really help move things along and give guidance to people and to automakers and to insurance companies. Hopefully that'll happen sooner rather than later. Hopefully, because everybody here is talking about the technology that's coming. Mm -hmm. It's good to get a dose of reality of what the law and liability might have to say about it. Absolutely. Gail Goddard, thanks so much for your a time pleasure. today. Very Thank interesting. You so much. Yeah.